This is the second video in a series of videos I'm making detailing the build of a large white oak trestle table. I first worked with a customer to put this design together, then once the design was settled on, I set upon actually building it. This whole project started out milling lumber from these three white oak logs, and then turning them into this table. So the following clips are sort of some highlights from the first video if you haven't seen that. This will help you kind of follow along in this one, or you can go watch that one first. But basically these logs were handled with a heavy forklift loaded onto this bandsaw mill, which is fully hydraulic, and then milled into the various size lumber that I needed. The wood was dried for about two months, and then once out of the kiln, I needed to plane it. I just have a lunchbox style planer, so that's way too small to plane this large scale of lumber. It would look like uh, crap probably when it came out of there due to the boards being jerked around and having to be pulled. So I used my uh, Sawyer's uh, planer in his cabinet shop. It's a large planer, as you can see. It's got a helical cutter head, which is sort of a spiral with a bunch of indexable uh, cutters. You can look more into that if you like, but it makes for a really smooth, more of a shearing cut than the straight planer blade type cut. And then that's the space I made the top in. This top was way too large to make in my tiny basement shop. Too big and too heavy. So I used another fella's shop for a week to put this together, which was great. All the uh, concrete floors, easy to roll things around, uh, plenty of space. He had a forklift. It was great. Just gave him a little bit of cash. And uh, as big as this room is, I didn't really take that much space up because it's uh, such a big building. It was nice to pull my truck in keep all my tools in the truck it was great and the first thing I had to do was get a nice straight edge on all of my boards and I used my Festool TS75 track saw with two tracks joined together and I used a better betterly straight edge it's a tool used to align tracks and I bought it for this project um, to get those tracks nice and lined up before I tighten them down using those little connecting rods um, and also used a new blade which was one of those Ashlan which is a sort of a discount um, blade maker, and they make some blades that fit the um, two track saws. And I think it was the 36 tooth, bought it off Amazon. I'm gonna try to put some of these links down in the description below for some of the tools that I'm talking about and using in this video. So what you see me gearing up for here is putting domino uh, tenons in between the boards. I'm doing this for alignment only, just to where when I clamp the boards up, they don't shift everywhere. I guess there's some additional strength, but there's plenty of strength in a glue joint like this. These are two-inch boards. Um, if it wasn't for alignment issues, I wouldn't put any sort of uh, uh, you know, mechanical thing in between any of the boards, whether it be biscuits or dominoes, but it really simplifies things during the clamp up to not have to worry about things going out of alignment. And dominoes in particular are much more accurate than using um, uh, biscuits. So all I'm doing is I measure down. I think these were 16 inches apart across the 12 foot length and then used a drywall square, which is a very handy tool in a wood shop to make a mark on each board. And then the uh, domino joiner lines up with those marks. And you have to cut one in each board. Um, for doing alignment, I use eight millimeter dominoes in pretty much any table I use with a top that's three quarters of an inch or larger, which is uh, most of my stuff has one inch tops. So they were eight millimeters by um, 50 millimeters. So they go 25 millimeters into each side. I've got another video on my channel of using this tool to make table bases if you're interested. So this is not meant to sound defensive. I don't care what anybody says about any tool I have, but I've heard a lot of chatter on the internet about Fest Tool, um, specifically the Domino. Thinking of it as sort of like you're cheating or something, when in reality, all this tool is, is creating a floating tenon or a loose tenon, which is nothing new to woodworking. Basically, all that's new is having a tool this compact that cuts that slot that easily versus using something like a horizontal mortiser or going through the trouble that it takes to cut them with a router or by hand, a hollow chisel mortiser, or any of the number of ways that you can cut um, a mortise such as these. Back to the project. Um, all that's happened is these boards have had glue applied and then those eight millimeter dominoes knocked into the holes. And then to get everything lined up, it was nice to have a helper and having these large saw horses. I had paper trying to keep the glue off my new saw horses, which was stupid. So I just had to rip that off because it was getting all in the glue joint. 
And then using clamps, that's what helps kind of pull those things together. The domino is a nice tight-fitting joint, so the clamps are really required to pull something where there's this many of them having to go uh, be pulled together at once. And this is a bunch of Bessie uh, K-body clamps. These were the fellows that I'm using his shop, which was really nice to have. They were kind of tricky to use, in my opinion, versus pipe clamps, but that might just be the older style they are, and perhaps they're more heavily used. I'm not sure. Um, they're just a little tricky to me. I pinched my fingers on them a couple times doing different things. Um, but yeah. Uh, I scraped the glue off the underside, um, or I mean the top side, and then flipped it over and scraped the glue again, and then kind of belt sanded the bottom of the table. And I don't worry too much about the bottoms of my tables. I just get them uh, nice and smooth, but I'm not going to take them to a really high grit. So I'm probably using a, a 100 grit belt or an 80 grit belt or something. And, and then that's the finished surface. And then I'll um, use my orbital sand around the edges on the underside just to smooth it up for people's hands. Any areas where there's a lot more wood to remove than a belt sander is efficient to use, I just use a hand plane and knock it down really quickly. And then later in the video, I'm going to fill all the imperfections in the top with epoxy. And so I go ahead and taped up all of those cracks and any kind of hole at all, any sort of hole at all that comes through the bottom of the table, whether or not I was going to fill it or not, because I didn't know. And while I had it all flipped over, that was the easiest time to do it. And here you get to see me almost drop the entire slab on the floor, which would have could have potentially been a disaster. It's a strong glue joint, but... That thing slammed into the floor it would have been a potential problem plus it would have been heavy to fool with um, and so working alone i do pretty much everything i do alone and so i wanted to include some of those clips in this video just sort of showing the kind of things you got to do i call this turtling anytime i get under something heavy and pick it up on my back which includes slabs like this and big slabs of wood moving them around and then my tables i crawl under my tables and I've carried them right into customers' houses on my back when they couldn't help me themselves. Um, so there's all different kinds of little tricks. It's amazing what you can do on your own once you're kind of used to doing it. And I'm sure a lot of you are reflecting on your, your own personal projects now of uh, some of the wild stuff you've done on your own that uh, no person should be able to do, but you somehow figure it out. So for this segment of the video, there's not a whole lot to explain. I'm just gluing the two halves up. Uh, into the single slab that makes up the whole top. It's the same process with the dominoes in between. The reason I glued it up into two halves was just uh, the ease of the job and to make sure that I had enough working time with the glue. So I just glued up one half, clamped that up, clamped up the other half, and then once it was all dry the next day, I clamped it all together just using longer clamps. So same process, bigger clamps. The clips that are coming up in a second are going to be on filling uh, all the knot holes and stuff with epoxy. And there's a number of ways to go about this and brands to use. But what I use is uh, West System 105 epoxy and I buy it in gallon cans. It is an expensive purchase all at once, but overall it's a much less expensive way to get a lot of epoxy, especially if you're using a lot of it. And I use it for a variety of projects, whether it be woodworking or other projects. And I tin it black with uh, black chalk for chalk lines. And it doesn't come out super black. It's more like a really dark brown. So if, you're, uh, if you need to use something darker, they make different pigments, whether they be powder or liquid. With the top, with the top all glued up, I needed to get to work sanding it. And since I can't send this through any drum sander that I have or... Anyone else I know has, I sanded it all out with my belt sander. And mainly that was just sanding down the epoxy and then just kind of feathering out any marks that I made. Uh, the top was pretty smooth from the planer. I did have to kind of remove some ridges for some nicks in the blade, but overall it was a smooth top. So it was very quick just to knock down the epoxy and smooth things out. Then I used my track saw to square the ends. I do all my tables like that. I glue them up long and trim them um, clean on the ends afterwards makes for a very clean cut and I didn't film it I forgot to but I just went around the whole table with a router and with just a little quarter round bit and just rounded over the edges just uh, just a little bit not much just to kind of knock off that hard uh, corner and then I ran over the whole thing very quickly just maybe five ten minutes with the orbital sander with some 220 grit and then used the vacuum that I hook up to all of my tools that have vacuums 
which is a Bosch, uh, it's a nine-gallon Bosch dust extractor, which is a fancy word for a vacuum cleaner. Um, I suck off all the dust and I blow it off really hard with air just to really make sure I've got it as clean as possible. It's not the most important thing in the world, but you just want to have it uh, reasonably clean. The customer that ordered this table had other pieces of furniture that they liked, that they wanted this table to kind of closely match in color. So I ended up settling on Minwax Jacobean uh, wood stain. That's just an oil-based stain, and I'm applying it with a cloth. And I had a little, um, uh, I don't know if it was a back and forth or not. I can't remember. I get a lot of comments. But another fellow was saying that I should stain the top and then the edges because it... Uh, makes for less drip marks on the edges or something like that. But I like to do the edges first, then do the top, then I go back around and wipe the edges. That way, if anything does run during it, it's not this streaky line that soaks in. It's kind of tempered a little bit by the fact that there's already some stain on the edge. Then when I come back around and wipe it off or just kind of wipe it down with the rag I've been applying the stain with, it just blends right in. And then when it comes time to wipe a stain off, and I usually wait 15 minutes, I really wipe it off, especially on something like oak where it can uh, soak down on the into the pores and bleed out under your finish later as it's off-gassing. So I really like to get it wiped down good and let it sit as long as possible before I spray on the clear coat. Um, and in this next uh, part of the video using the forklift, this was probably my favorite part of this video and the whole project probably was just using the forklift. It was just kind of fun. You know, normally I'm carrying things around and, and things are much smaller scale. So when you're making something that's big enough and awkward enough to where you need a forklift to move it, uh, it's pretty exciting. And it just made for such an easy process. Instead of crawling around under the table, I just picked it up like it's on a car lift and uh, sealed the bottom. And I used a Minwax Polycrylic. And I, get, I got several people asked why I didn't stain the bottom or why I didn't tape things off easy, uh, you know, nice and even on the bottom. It, it really had to do with just moving quick on this project, and it, and it didn't make a huge difference anyway. These people are not going to be crawling around under the table looking at it. And even if they did look under there, they're not going to have a problem with that. Um, so I just got it sealed to where the top and the bottom were even. I put it back on those rolling carts and rolled it outside. And you're also going to see I've kind of put in some different clips into this video and really the first one where I posted the entire build in that one 20-ish minute long video um, showing some of the parts about making a video. Like right here, this is where I normally, you know, I, I go that far and I have to run back, grab the camera, take the camera, set the camera in the next position. You know, someone making videos, it's it's such a so much more than just the project you're making even if you're just doing a simple project, but when you're doing something that's really involved like this project that already takes an enormous amount of time, making a video on it is uh, something else. I mean, it can double the amount of time a project takes or more sometimes. Um, also got asked about the spray gun. This is just a cheap Harbor Freight spray gun. They range between 10 and $15, depending if it's on sale. And I'm spraying ML Campbell's, I think it's Magnolac. It's just a pre-catalyzed lacquer and it dries very hard i really liked it and it dries ultra fast by the time i was done spraying the table i could go back to where i started spraying and start sanding uh, i did end up you know i gave it like five minutes or so but this is even um this is like the week before thanksgiving right now when i'm doing this so it's fairly cool outside and it's still dried fast i mean even at the temperatures that it was um, and I think the total amount of coats I did were maybe three or four total. I think, you know, what I've been told is you don't want to go too many coats on um, lacquer. You can risk some different issues happening. And then once it was all said and done and it was all dry, the base was made. The final thing I did on this table, um, right here the table is done, but this is the last step that I did on the actual tabletop is I buffed out the finish by hand to sort of a satin, and I used 3M finishing pads. They have multiple different grip, grits. This is the gray pad. It's the one that's meant to do in-between coats. The white pad, which is the finishing one, was too smooth to actually cut into the lacquer at all, so it didn't really make that much difference. So I stepped it down to the gray pad, which sort of just took that brand new shine off of it, and it also took out the streakiness that you get from overspray from a spray gun. 
Um, and that had a lot to do with the temperature that it was outside, but it really did have a nice even sheen over it. And I'm not a fan of things looking too shiny. I like a nice clean looking finish, but I don't want it to look like plastic. And then this removed any kind of plasticness or plastic like look that the finish had. So in the end, I was very happy. You can see I'm checking there for sheen. And, and I'm not sure if it really shows up in the video, but you know, when I was there working it, it was a it was a difference and it was leaving this very fine white dust on the table, so it was cutting into it. So like I said, in the end, I was pretty happy with the finish. And that pretty much wraps up the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them in the comments below or leave a comment, let me know what you think. Um, the next video is going to be much more detailed than this video. In the end, this video really just details joining the edges, some boards, gluing up a top, and putting on the finish. I did want to show a lot of steps, but you know, it required some rambling to fill in all that dead space, so sorry about that. Uh, and, um, but the next video is going to be pretty high action. There's a lot of joinery going on, a lot of decisions I had to make. So I think there's going to be a lot to go over in that video, and it'll probably be a little longer than this one, even though this one's gone on for over 15 minutes, I think. I think that is all to say. Um, thanks for watching. See you in the next one.